I'll move on now to talk about the creature's narrative. And you'll probably notice I'm, I'm using the term creature rather than monster. Normally people talk about mon Frankenstein's monster, or sometimes call the creature Frankenstein in a sort of confusion between the creator and the creature. I, just, I prefer the term creature because monster seems, seems rather judgmental. And um, one of the things I think this novel is good at is not making judgments about its characters, about presenting them in quite complicated ways and in quite ambivalent, in quite double ways. Shelley's account of the creature's development draws on various philosophical ideas about identity and education, most notably by John Locke and by Rousseau. During the winter of 1816 to 17, so during the time of the composition of the novel, she and Percy Shelley read Locke's essay concerning human understanding. According to Locke, an empiricist philosopher, the human mind begins life as a white paper, void of all characters, without any ideas. All its ideas come from experience, either from sensation, that is perceptions of the world, or from reflection, where the mind self-consciously perceives its own operations. Locke's philosophy, then, tended to support the argument that a person's character depended on their experiences. So it wasn't a matter of their innate ideas or their innate tendencies, but it came from what happened to them and how they experienced the world. Um, and that's, I suppose, the idea of empiricism, as you'll see on the slide, that the idea that all our ideas and everything that makes us comes from our experiences. There's nothing innately there. This empiricism also influenced Rousseau's ideas of human development. The key texts by Rousseau with regard to the creature's narrative are the discourse on inequality and Emile. As I was saying earlier, the discourse argues that human beings are happier and more authentic in a state of nature. And Emile considers how children, or at least male children, can best be nurtured and educated to enter society whilst preserving their natural innocence. At one point, Rousseau imagines the confused and idiotic state of, quote, a child who had, had at his birth the stature and strength of a grown man. Like the creature, such a child would have no more understanding of the world than a small baby. And we see exactly this in the opening of the creature's narrative. It attempts to describe an infantile state before language, in which the blank slate of the creature's mind is bombarded by sensations that are confused and indistinct. The creature describes how he was unable to distinguish between the operations of his various senses and how he had no distinct ideas. His mind is an unruly mass of sensory information and basic desires. So there's nothing monstrous, nothing innately monstrous about the creature's mind. He actually, actually follows exactly the pattern of normal human development described by Locke. However, this development, as we discover, is not a pleasant process, particularly because the creature is effectively an abandoned child. So unprotected from the cold, he becomes overwhelmed by pain and confusion. As time passes, the creature becomes able to attach distinct ideas to distinct objects through a process of sensation and then reflection. And by discovering fire, he moves from what Rousseau would think of as a pure state of nature to use the most basic technology associated with human culture. Like his creator, the creature is a sort of scientist conducting experiments to try and improve on his natural existence. He learns to dry wood, fan embers and cook food. This makes his existence more comfortable, but lack of food forces him to travel away, and then he encounters human civilization for the first time. And this is, of course, when it all goes wrong. We no longer have a solitary, natural man, as Rousseau would imagine him. He does get food and shelter, but he has to deal with other individuals and their hostile responses to him. And that leads eventually to, to self-loathing and a sense of alienation, and then um, his, his sort of wrath against the rest of the world. So the creature's biographical narrative presents in microcosm romantic debates about nature versus culture. And it encapsulates, I think, the novel's ambivalent attitude to those debates. For Rousseau, the natural man is relatively happy because he's autonomous, he's self-sufficient, and he lacks the artificial needs created by culture. He does feel some sort of innate compassion for other human beings, um, but he doesn't engage in social relationships, 
And this is Rousseau. Savage man wandering in the forest without work, without speech and without relationships was equally without any need for his fellow men and without any desire to hurt them. It is significant that the creature does not describe himself as lonely during the early stages of his life. This only begins when he encounters the de Lacy family. Rousseau argues that most forms of human unhappiness would have been avoided if humanity had stayed in its natural state. Physical health, for Rousseau, is related to psychological health. Furthermore, the state of reflection, he says, is contrary to the state of nature. The man that meditates, says Rousseau, is a depraved, i.e. corrupt, mind. The worst thing for, about reflection for Rousseau is that it gives rise to what he calls amour propre, which is a sort of selfish pride born of social interaction. It's when you start worrying about what other people think of you that it all goes wrong and you develop this pride. And again, it's notable the creature only becomes psychologically troubled and alienated from himself when he starts to compare himself to the de Lacy's and reflect on how they might perceive him. And of course, it's when he's sort of spying on the de Lacy's, he goes and looks at his reflection in the, in, in, in the pool of water and suddenly sees himself as an other, sees himself as a monster. And among other things, that moment alludes to Paradise Lost when Eve sees her own reflection in the, in the, in the water and is sort of enamoured of it. Um, Shelley offers a sort of parodic version of that where the creature is self-disgusted. In his conclusion to the discourse on inequality, Rousseau contrasts the peace and freedom of the savage man with the sort of agony and alienation of the civil man. And this is a quotation on the slide. This is the civil man, the civilised man, if you like. Being always active, sweating and restless, he torments himself endlessly in search of ever more laborious occupations. He works himself to death. He even runs towards the grave to put himself into shape to live, or renounces life in order to gain immortality. This seems extraordinarily appropriate as a description of Victor Frankenstein, who has a very strong sense of amor prop, and whose case enacts Rousseau's metaphors. His laborious activity in pursuit of glory, immortality, entails a literal running into the grave in order to try and create, improve and extend human life, that desire for immortality again. And of course, as we know, it leads to all kinds of negative results. But it, I think this quotation is also true of the creature. As he experiences society, he learns language and he reflects on his experiences. He becomes restless and troubled um, and ends up with a very strong desire for revenge, leading to the destruction of others and his own suicide. So there's another running into the grave going on here. In my final section, I'm going to say a bit more about the idea of the state of nature, which Shelley had partly taken from Rousseau. A crucial point is that the novel does not idealise Rousseau's state of nature. The creature suffers a great deal of pain from hunger, cold and confusion. As I was saying earlier, aspects of human culture help him. Fire keeps him warm, makes his food more pleasant. He benefits from food and shelter at the, at the shepherd's house. And he strongly admires the first village he encounters. But the book does not idealise human culture either. Fire can cause pain as well as pleasure, and social existence exposes you to the prejudices and selfish, in, selfish interests of others. It can also make you alienated from yourself, as I was saying, because you start to worry about how others perceive you. It's fitting, therefore, that the creature uses the simple technology of fire to destroy the delays cottage after they've rejected him, and he also uses it to end his own life. However, and I think this is perhaps the problem the novel has with Rousseau. It doesn't think of culture as a choice, whereas Rousseau at times seems to think it is something you can, you can choose or not choose. It seems, I think, in this novel as an inevitable result of the human capacity to reflect. Individuals will seek to better their condition. They will seek to conduct experiments and they will reflect on their minds. Experience cannot be unlearned even if its effects are very unfortunate ones. The creature puts it very well, I think. Knowledge, he says, clings to the mind when it has once seized on it, like a lichen on a rock. So he's using a, a, a deliberately organic, natural simile there to make the point about 
the naturalness of knowledge. Perhaps, I mean, I often see this in, in student essays. They talk about how Frankenstein's creation of life transgresses some sort of natural order. And, of course, there is an element of truth to that. And in a later version of Frankenstein, in the 1831 version, it was originally published in 1818, Mary Shelley adds a preface that really makes that point and really emphasises that Frankenstein is transgressing into the realms of God. But I'm not sure that the earlier version of the novel was quite so clear-cut on that. I mean, perhaps Frankenstein's transgression, his unwillingness to stay within what seem to be the bounds of knowledge, is itself part of a natural process. Is, and I think the novel was really asking, among other things, is Frankenstein's desire to prolong life and banish disease really that different in kind from the creature's fanning of the fire to keep away the cold? They're all attempts to ameliorate the human condition through technology. Frankenstein challenges the categories of human and monstrous. What makes it so di difficult to embrace the other, the foreign, is it can mean embracing one's own fears and anxieties about oneself. This is quite a complicated point, and for this I'm going to turn to the opening page of Rousseau's book, Emile, his educational tract. And again, Rousseau isn't always consistent, but he's pretty consistent on the idea of the state of the nature and the natural being better than the cultural, and you'll see that in this quotation. Everything is good as it leaves the hands of the author of things, God. Everything degenerates in the hands of man. He forces one soil to nourish the products of another. He mixes and confuses the climates, the elements, the seasons. He turns everything upside down. He disfigures everything. He loves deformity, monsters. He wants nothing as nature made it, not even man. In the present state of things, a man abandoned to himself in the midst of other men from birth would be the most disfigured of all. Prejudices, authority, necessity, example, all the social institutions in which we find ourselves submerged would stifle nature, nature in him and put nothing in its place. Nature there would be like a shrub that chance had caused to be born in the middle of a path and that the passers-by soon caused to perish by bumping into it from all sides and bending it in every direction. It's quite a complicated quotation, that, but I think obviously a very apt one in the 18th century, perhaps an even more apt one now when we're all concerned about um, environmental changes and catastrophes and so on. Human beings of Rousseau corrupt the natural environment and natural ways of behaving. Frankenstein's desire to improve the natural human being exemplifies this in the starkest possible way. As Rousseau puts it, not even man is free from humanity's meddling. Human culture, then, for Rousseau, is monstrous because it's contrary to nature and corrupts and perverts nature when it encounters it. And I think, as I was implying earlier, there might be something rather problematic the, about this distinction between culture and nature, that this, this, is, this, is, this is an idea that Rousseau has and other people have, but it's not something we should assume as a clear dichotomy. Rousseau's partly talking about technology, but he's talking more broadly about about the ways in which human beings organise themselves and the world, particularly social institutions he's thinking about. Frankenstein, I don't think, endorses Rousseau's view, but it engages with Rousseau's view. I suppose a Rousseauvian reading of Frankenstein would be to, that simply that human institutions, families, communities, uh, political organisations, the legal system, respond to the creature's otherness by excluding it. Another way of thinking about it would be to consider how they might construct the creature's otherness. That there's nothing intrinsically foreign or monstrous about the creature. It's a matter of perception. It's a matter, matter of how institutions imagine him. Institutions are defined by what they exclude, I suppose. In a sense, he literalises Rousseau's metaphor of disfigurement. Um, a man abandoned to himself in the midst of other men from birth would be the most disfigured of all. Supposedly unnatural, he is in fact far closer to nature than anyone else he encounters. Like Rousseau's shrub, though, he is beset by prejudices 
to the extent that his natural benevolence is stifled and he is made monstrous. The creature hopes to freeze, or at least reverse this process, by getting Frankenstein to making him a bride, who will provide him with the unprejudiced companionship he craves. He imagines that they will escape from human civilization into something like a Rousseauian state of nature. And the passage here from Frankenstein is quite um, similar, I think, to some passages in Rousseau. This is the creature speaking. I will go to the vast wilds of South America. My food is not that of man. I do not destroy the lamb and the kid to glut my appetite. Acorns and berries afford me sufficient nourishment. My companion will be of the same nature as myself and will be content with the same fare. We shall make our bed of dried leaves. The sun will shine on us as on man and will ripen our food. The picture I present to you is peaceful and human. The future that the creature envisages for himself and his companion is natural, simple, completely peaceful, even vegetarian, and apparently more authentically human than any form of social organisation. That's a very Rousseauian assumption. Now, one might argue that it's simply society's prejudices, ex exemplified by Victor's refusal to create a companion for the creature, that prevent this id all from happening. But I think a more interesting reading, and one that's truer to the novel, would be to consider the way in which the creature's idol, like all such idols, is revealed to be a fantasy. Even Rousseau admitted the state of nature may never have really existed. 